Hello, Joe Simhart here. It's March 5th, uh, 2022. Um, the topic for today is going to be about the invasion of Ukraine. My mother was born in Budapest in 1924. Her name was Puhas Ilona. Ilona translates as Helen in English. And Ilona grew up in a time when the depression hit Europe badly during the uh, 30s. And then the war broke out. And of course, Hungary aligned with the Axis and uh, all kinds of hell broke loose. Uh, as a young woman, she would have to run from <clears throat> uh, bombs that were falling around Budapest, uh, hiding in bomb shelters wherever they could find them. Uh, her grandfather had dug a bomb shelter in his backyard, as did my grandfather, and they used it with their little family and their dog whenever these bombs were going off. Um, <clears throat> toward the end of the war, the communists were coming into Hungary and uh, it looked like it was the end. The German Nazis told people to leave their homes and that they could probably come back within a month or so after things settled down. So. Uh, my mother's family was uh, forced to leave the house. My grandfather stayed behind, of course. He was uh, working for the Axis. And um, so he got arrested. <clears throat> they took his home. Meanwhile, my mother, her sister, um, my grandmother, they fled on foot by truck and by train till they got to Germany to displaced persons camps after the war ended. And they never got back to Hungary. They lost everything to the communists. So my father, in the meantime, was a uh, mechanical electrician who was drafted into the uh, Axis army and he worked in Germany in a factory that rehabbed the Fock 100 uh, fighter jets for the Germans. And so that's what he did in the war for the uh, Air Force. Um, he was captured a prisoner of war with the Allies. He eventually got freed. He met my mother at the DP camp in Pocking. Uh, they got married in that devastation. And I was born there in 1947. They were in these camps for around six years after the war. In 1951, they finally got passage to the United States. Uh, one of my dad's aunts sponsored us. And we came through Ellis Island with $9, and we started a life here in the United States. So when my mother watches the news now, <clears throat> my father's passed away. And by the way, this is one of his caps he left behind. Uh, but my mother... I cannot watch this news uh, regarding Ukraine. It brings back a lot of bad memories and suffering. And uh, she knows viscerally what these people are probably going through. But why are they going through this? What the hell is going on here? And uh, what is it about Putin? What makes him uh, do what he does? What drives him? Well, one way to look at Putin is through someone that they have called, pundits have called, Putin's brain, Alexander Dugin. And Dugin is a kind of a political philosopher who, in 1997, wrote a book uh, to uh, explain that Russia was the center of this great historical destiny uh, to become the... Um, uh, center of Eurasia and, and Eurasian culture. Uh, and of course, that would cause, <clears throat> that would include all of Europe and, and China. Um, it was called the foundation of geopolitics. <clears throat> and in, in Russian, it looks like this. Let me give you a quick look at this. Um, there it is. So Dugan being Putin's brain believes in something, and he believes in what's called traditionalism. Now, traditionalism is a combination of a lot of things. Part of it is uh, comes from Heidegger's atheistic or mystical uh, 
existentialism, which influenced Dugan, as well as many other neoconservatives, uh, the idea that that um, you have to have some kind of a cultural cohesion, a narrative, what Plato called a noble lie, uh, in order to keep the polis, the society, t together. And, and of course, that noble lie could be Buddhism for Buddhists, Christian, uh, Christianity for Christians, and Hinduism for Hindus. Um, but the idea is to encourage that this one way of looking at life is uh, the dominant uh, view in any particular nation. And of course, we know that Putin promotes Russian orthodoxy. So Dugan got his ideas from this guy, uh, Rene Guénon, as well as Heidegger. Now, Guénon wrote a book that I read when I was getting out of a cult, uh, Church Universal and Triumphant, that was based on theosophy. And he wrote this in 1921, Theosophy, the History of a Pseudo-Religion, uh, but it didn't come out in English until 2001, so I tried to read it in French in 1981 with help of a friend, and it helped me quite a bit. Uh, Grenon is a brilliant writer. He understood the traditions quite well. He was Catholic in, in France. He converted to Sufism and Islam uh, uh, type of... Uh, uh, orientation, a mystical orientation in Islam. Um, he had studied Freemasonry. So I was quite impressed with Gwenon, as was Dugan, and as, of course, uh, was Bannon, which is covered here in the Devil's Bargain. Uh, Bannon was quite taken with Gwenon's work and uh, the idea of traditionalism. But I soon learned that Gwenon was really a basis for a type of fascism, and uh, so I rejected him early on in the 80s. But his influence is quite deep. Uh, there are many variations on his theme. Uh, Julius Evola in Italy picked up on Guénon's traditionalism. He influenced Mussolini with this idea of fascism, that the nation is somehow destined by history, by God, whatever you want to put in there, or by the will, Nietzsche's will, the will to power, in order to go through a particular change that would bring about a great new age, a golden age. And uh, this is based on Gwenon's idea of cycles that he got from Hinduism, that we are leaving the Kali Yuga and we have to spark this coming of a new Sat Yuga, which is a golden age, a holy age. And the way to do that, according to fascism, is you can do it through war, you can do it through other means, but war is one means of cleansing the society so that this new age can appear like a phoenix out of the ashes. So, you know, the idea behind this, that if you destroy everything, um, you make everything new, much like um, burning down a forest in order to grow new crops. So with that in mind and watching what Putin's doing, he is actually following a, 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 this kind of philosophy. Um, the new statesman, October 2020, uh, wrote about this and about went on. I just copied this article, The Rise of the Traditionalists, How a Mystical Doctrine is Reshaping the Right. Steve Bannon, Russia's Alexander Dugan, and Brazil's Olavo de Corvalho are united by their affinity with a spiritual movement that, that fundamentally rejects modernity. So modernity is what people call progressivism, but really what it is is the march of science to learn new things, uh, challenges old ways of thinking. Uh, people have to change their minds about a lot of things because of social science, historical science, agricultural science, you know, uh, the, the hard sciences like mathematics and physics. Uh, we've gone through quite a few changes and there's a lot of resistance to these changes. And one of these things that resists this change is called traditionalism you know, to hold back, to keep what is good. And, and traditionalism, according to Guénon, believes that there's some kind of an ideal something, a perennial wisdom out there, which we're going to achieve if we read his books and, uh, and follow his, his advice. Um, there's a lot of danger in, in traditionalism. Uh, the cult I was in, Church Universal and Triumphant, taught a version of it, and they were quite fascist uh, when I was involved in the late 70s. Uh, here in this book, The Devil's Bargain, by Joshua Green, it came out a few years ago, uh, he says that uh, 
Quinon's The Crisis of the Modern World, which came out in 27, and Evola's Revolt Against the Modern World, 1934, are what drew Bannon's interest to traditionalism, although he was also very much taken with its spiritual aspects, citing Quinon's 1925 book, Man and His Becoming According to the Vedanta, which is Hindu scripture. And, and Bannon called it a life-changing discovery. Now, this also happened to Dugan. He read, went on, and uh, it became a life-changing uh, motivation for him. Uh, so these people promote ultra-Catholicism, ultra-Hinduism. In some cases, it's Nazism. For instance, the Golden Dawn group, which Dugan uh, and some right-wing pundits in the U.S. Uh, uh, support. Um, the Golden Dawn uh, is in Greece, and it's a neo-fascist movement, uh, which has gotten a lot of uh, attraction within politics down there. Um, so we have a, a continual pressure for this traditionalism which is a kind of a masked fascism to begin to take over nations again. Uh, here in this book, uh, The Devil's Bargain, for all his paranoid alarm, Bannon believes that the rise of nationalist movements across the world from Europe to Japan to the United States heralds a return to tradition. You have to control three things, he explained, borders, currency, and military and national identity. So it's really important. You, you want to be a real Russian, a real American, a real whatever, a real Greek, a real Hindu, define it any way you want. Uh, people are finally come to realize that and politicians will have to follow, Bannon says. The clearest example of traditionalist political influence today is in Russia. Vladimir Putin's chief ideologist, Alexander Dugin, who I mentioned, whom Bannon has cited, translated Evola's work into Russian and later developed a Russian nationalist variant of traditional, traditionalism known as Eurasianism. So this Eurasianism is what's driving a lot of what you're seeing going on in the Ukraine. This isn't just one country taking over another. This is an ideology. And it's in, in um, the studies of Robert Lifton on brainwashing in China, he has come to call this ideological totalism. This book is one that I've used uh, in hundreds of cases in deprogrammings or interventions to try to explain to people what this is. You know, what is it that that causes uh, or, or defines um, psychological constriction and, and this ideological totalism that, that shrinks down uh, what kind of political behavior you can uh, employ in order to have truth and, and uh, thriving nation. Uh, as I mentioned, Leo Strauss, the American philosopher, has influenced a lot of American uh, uh, people on the far right, and he believes in this idea of tradition, uh, that there is uh, something called the noble lie, which we have to promote as a narrative, and uh, that noble lie could be that we are a Christian nation. Um, Obviously, the people that believe in it don't think it's a lie. They, they see it as the truth, as something that the politician is really trying to sell you because they think the politician believes in this sort of thing, too. Now, some might, but most just use it in order to manipulate the masses. And it, that's exactly what Bannon and Dugan and others believe, that you should find a political way to manipulate the masses in order to bring about this big change, uh, to purge the society of this progressive nonsense, uh, to get rid of the George Soroses of the world, and uh, to bring about the golden age. Uh, Dugan even called his form of fascism a fascist fascism. In other words, he felt that Hitler had failed. He had uh, kind of bungled the idea that Mussolini was working on and that Evola and uh, Guinan had defined. So having Putin's ear, he, Putin believes he has this great historical mission to uh, bring about, you know, tradition as Gwynon defines it. Anyway, uh, I had, uh, as I said, rejected Gwynon uh, because I found him quite fallible and uh, quite closed-minded to uh, other points of view. In fact, it took a lot of his followers uh, almost two decades to convince him that Buddhism was 
uh, tradition, and he finally gave into that. So what I would uh, be very careful of is uh, treating your ideology like ideological totalism as if it was some kind of a brick that uh, fell out of heaven and, uh, you know, that it's, it's a solid thing that you can depend on and uh, it's not going to change and somehow you can actually weaponize this thing called ideological totalism and throw it at people until you get them under your thumb uh, to control them much as Hitler and Mussolini and now Putin uh, are trying to do. So I hope you gain something from that. Um, I know it's a difficult topic to absorb, but I'll put some notes in uh, that you can find some leads to do your own reading. Thank you for listening.